Hello everyone and welcome to In the Community. I'm your host, Jennifer Beck. I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to Tori Hope Peterson. I first met Tori back in 2014 at the state track meet in Columbus. Tori was a senior track standout from Tenora. She won four state championships that year. That day I learned that Tori devoted her running to God. I also learned that Tori had grown up in the foster care system, but there was so much more to her story then and so much has happened since that time. Tori is now married, mother of two, a speaker, an author, and a woman who wants to spread God's love to everyone she meets. Here's my conversation with Defiance resident, Tori Hope Peterson. Tori Peterson, so great to have you here in the studio. Thank you. 2014 is when we met <laughs> on the track, Jesse O Stadium, uh, seems like a lifetime ago. It actually was a little while ago. You don't look any different, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That means so much. I know it's crazy to think like it's literally been nine years. That's wild. And God has done some incredible things in your life in nine years, mm. but not just in the past nine years. If we go further back and we look and see how God was working in your life way back earlier, um, you're here today for many reasons, but one is because you wrote the book Fostered and it chronicles your life. So let's go ahead and, and just start from the beginning, wherever you want to start of uh, your God story, really your God story. I was born to a single mom. So my biological father passed away a month before I was born. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I would have ever known him because of the circumstance and which I was conceived and my mom was not with him, but he passed away a month before I was born. So my mom was a single mom and my mom had a very difficult upbringing. She had experienced being trafficked at a young age and she had experienced a lot of abuse and she hadn't healed from that abuse. There wasn't mm -hmm. resources, I think, like there are now, mm -hmm. like the ones that I have access to, she didn't have access to those. Uh, but I was born to her and as I got older, things just got, got bad. I went to the foster care for the first time when I was four years old <laughs> due to a drug bust. <laughs> And I was actually reunited with my mom. That's one of the roles of the foster care system mm -hmm. is to reunite families. And so they did that. And I spent a good amount of time with my mom. But as I got older, as my mom got older, her mental illness got worse. Mm -hmm. And so I reentered the foster care system again as an adolescent, this time with my sister, who was nine and a half years younger than me. And the first time I went into care, I remember thinking, like, I just want to be with my mom. And the second time I went into care, I remember thinking, I think that we can have a family. I mm -hmm. think that we are gonna escape the abuse and the hard things that we were going through. And it felt like freedom. I was excited to go into the foster care system, but within a month of being in that first home together, my mm -hmm. sister and I were separated. Mm -hmm. And she stayed at that home and I went to go move throughout 12 more homes throughout my entire time. <laughs> 12 in homes. The foster care system. 12 homes in less than 12 years. Yes, it was Far like over the course, course of five years. Wow, 12, so 12 homes in five years, really no time to get established. I know there were some very instrumental people in your life during that time, but just pinpoint, I mean, I mean not pinpoint, but over and over and over, you're getting thrown here and there. Um, but you stayed in the Tenora Defiance area, right? So you had that as a lock to keep you there. Yeah, something that I'm so thankful that my caseworkers did was they kept me in my school district. And that was because I was a 4.0 student. I took my academics very seriously and I was also running track at the time and I had a state qualifying relay. And I think that they saw that, that was, those were a lot of good things in my life and they didn't wanna take me from that. I also had good relationships with my teachers and we know, right, that relationships are healing. Mm. And so I think that they saw those things and didn't wanna take me away from them. But when I was moving from home to home, there were times where I'd have to go into a group home because they couldn't find a place for me. And so I would miss school for like three weeks. <laughs> and then my GPA went down. I was so sad because I remember I wanted to be valedictorian mm. so bad because I wanted to stand on the stage and I wanted to show people. A lot of people thought because I was in the foster care system that I was a bad kid. Mm. And I thought, I want to show these people I can be valedictorian. I can be on a stage. And if I'm valedictorian, then maybe I'm not a bad, I, I can show them that I'm not a bad kid. But my GPA went down because I was, went to a group home for about a month. And in between my junior and senior year, though, I had a track coach. He, he was in my life my sophomore year. 
uh, as my coach, but it was really in between my junior and senior year that we started to train together regularly, and I started to see him as a father figure and as a friend in the foster care system. You can be very isolated because there are a lot of rules and policies around mm -hmm. youth in foster care because they're kind of seen as a liability, not because they are, but because the state is responsible for them. Mm -hmm. The state doesn't want to have lawsuits against them. And so there were just a lot of rules. I didn't get to go to a friend's house unless their parents had background checks and uh, fingerprints and proof uh, of license and insurance. And a lot of people felt that was invasive mm. and they w didn't want to do it. So mm. I didn't have a lot of close friends. So I felt like my track coach was kind of like this, this safe place, my friend that I got to go to after school. And it was kind of the only place that I got to go, go to outside of home and school. And at one track practice, he said, Tori, I think you can go to the state track meet and I think you can win it. <laughs> and there was like, there was other narratives that I was he hearing that I was going to be a statistic, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I was bound for my kids to end up in foster care mm -hmm. or be pregnant before I graduated high school. And I heard these things mm -hmm. and I did think like, maybe I'm just destined for them. I heard the statistics and I tried to, again, I thought I could just work, you know, really hard to to escape those. And I also had a foster mom who was very just faithful. I outwardly and openly told everyone that I was an atheist and that I did not believe in God. Mm. I couldn't understand how there could be a good God if I had experienced so much suffering yeah. and if other kids had been experienced more suffering. But I had a foster mom who was super faithful and just kept taking me to church. Mm. And I had a lot of questions about God and she would patiently answer them. And a lot of times she'd just say, how about we just figure this out together? Mm. And through that, wow. I know, and I, I loved that because I think I, I had come across a good amount of Christians who just always wanted to tell me how it was. Mm. And for us to figure things out together, I, with her and through going to church, I understood that, you know, Jesus, right, is, we, Jesus came to earth and to live as a reflection mm -hmm. of how we're supposed to live. And so we're called to reflect Jesus. And if that's the truth, then we're, we're going to suffer. But the hope that we find is that Jesus' suffering mm -hmm. wasn't wasted. Right. His suffering was to proclaim love, mm -hmm. and he died on the cross for our sins. And so I realized, like, if I suffer, and if I reflect Jesus, my suffering isn't going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really took a perspective change on my life. And I said, I want my life to be for God's glory. Mm -hmm. Jesus' suffering was for God's glory. And I, I just started taking life, I think, even more seriously than I ever had. It wasn't so much about the accolades, but it was about something eternal. It was about the Lord. Yeah. And so I, I was running and I remember I would text Scott, my track coach, like every day and I'd be like, do you really believe that I can win state? Because I just didn't believe it. Like I didn't believe that someone could believe in me that way. And he said, I think you need to believe in yourself. And I didn't feel like I could believe in myself. I just wasn't there yet. But with I, everything I that you've gone through yeah. up to that point, I can understand why you say that. Yes. Yeah. And it, it was, I didn't have a good self-esteem. I felt like people were throwing me away, like no one wanted me. But I did. I was like, I can believe in God. Like I can believe in what God can do through me. And I just kept running. I kept training. And I remember like when I wanted to quit, I would just remember like for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And when I'd want to quit, I'd say, would a state champion quit? And I'd keep going. Mm -hmm. And that year I became a four-time state champion in track and field. And that's when I met her on the field at Jesse Owens Stadium because our station, WSN, we covered that track meet and I was the sideline reporter at the time. And here comes this amazing runner from Tenora who's wearing a shirt with sequined letters that say for God and then a track shoe with a flame with a with a wing on it and i thought first of all i have to interview her because she won but i gotta <laughs> ask her about this so i can remember standing there and asking you about that and you so very briefly said well i grew up in foster care and this just means a lot for me and i was inspired then but i had i just had no idea what god had been doing because i you know that day i saw you on that top of that podium four times and it was incredible but i also saw you run over and hug your coach and I didn't realize the whole significance behind that because there's so much track was a piece of God's puzzle. I mean, it was a link for you that God used, really used. 
Yeah, I'm getting emotional because <laughs> just to rethink, you know, everything that was happening during that time and everything that had to fall into place, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that I had never been to state individually. Yeah. I was up against the defending state champion. <laughs> the only thing, you know, the only way that that was possible was because God's hand was over my life. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, he, he came into my life and he gave me something to believe in, which I hadn't had before. And he gave me someone to believe in me, which I'd really never had before. And so I remember I ran to Scott and I remember he said, you did it. And I said, we did it. We did it. <laughs> because it felt like such a wee thing. Like there's just no way it would have been possible without the dedication of him. I mean, we trained every day together for hours. And if we weren't together, he would give me workouts. And I just never had someone that was so dedicated to mm -hmm. me. Well, the book is called Fostered. Uh, you really do need to purchase it if, if, if you haven't already. I mean, I read a lot of books. I get books all the time. And I overwhelmingly recommend this book, that you, that you should get it. But that is not the end of the story. You hugged Scott. Your track coach was there with you. But you were 18. You had, you had aged out of the foster care system. And you were still in high school. I was still in high school. I aged out of the foster care system on my 18th birthday, so that was February. And so I still had an, an entire semester left. I still had an entire track season left. I was bouncing around from home to home, people within my church, because like I said, I had come to the Lord and I was in community. I was dedicated to my church. I did feel like it was a family, but I couldn't stay. And like I said, my foster mom, people were like, well, why didn't your foster mom keep you? Well, she couldn't because the, the there's so legalities many regular, there's so many things in there. the foster care system. Yeah. Like if I could only stay with her if I stayed with an in the foster care system. And so when I aged out, I was bouncing around from home to home, people within the church. And it was really hard. Like there was this one time I was tutoring this young woman, um, this, this girl actually, she was like in the third grade. And her mom said, if you ever need anything, let me know. And that was when I was in the system. And so when I when I aged out, I called her and I said, I need a place to stay. Mm -hmm. She was like, okay, you can come here. And I was staying in her basement. You're a senior in high school. I was a senior in high school. Yeah. And I was like, I, I mean, I've everyone... got a daughter that just graduated. I know how much stress she has <laughs> in a home situation that doesn't have issues. You're a senior yes. yeah. and you're having to do all this. And I, I heard the narrative, like, if you emancipate, you're not going to be able to graduate. If she ages out, like, she's not going to have success in track. And it was kind of like people believed if I stayed into the foster care system, that would be the result, that, that's what would have been mm -hmm. why I was successful. And so I was really trying to be like, I know I need to go find a place to live and I know I need to figure this stuff out because I did, I did want to graduate and I did want to do well on track. And so I was staying at this woman's house and she ended up having black mold in her basement. And like, mm -hmm. we didn't know, no one lived in the basement before. And it was a nice looking basement. But I was breaking out in hives, and so I had to leave there. And then I was staying at a friend's house, mm -hmm. and it was very cold. I remember I was sleeping on the floor, and I had to go buy a space heater from Walmart to stay warm. And then, and I wasn't sleeping well because it was so cold, and I was having like turn on, not the space heater all night. And Scott just came to me, and he was like, Tori, you have to find a place to stay. Like, I need you to find a place to stay because the track meet is like coming up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. So I went to a youth leader. Um, in my youth group and I said like I need a place to stay my biological mom had made a lot of threats to her and so mm -hmm. she was very scared but she said like I know you need a place to stay I think people in the community understood the gravity of what God was doing and where things were heading and so even though my mom had made a lot of scary threats to her she let me live with her and Scott was driving me home from track practice and he said driving me home to her house and he said Tori I I want you to know that my daughters came to me and I've, mm -hmm. I've talked with them. And after the track season is over, I would like you to be a part of our family. And so the day of after the track meet was over, literally that day, <laughs> I moved in with Scott. And he's been my dad ever since. He's, I have, like I said, I have two children, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And that's who they call grandpa. He walked and you down the aisle when you got married. He walked me down the aisle at my wedding and he's my dad. <sighs> And your name changed too, because when you were in track, I knew you under Tori Abdul. Yes. And then the next thing I knew, you were... Uh, Tori Wickman. Tori Wick Wickman, yeah. yes. Yeah. And then now you're Tori Peterson, of yeah. course, because you moved on, you went to college, two colleges, met your husband at Hillsdale. Um, there's so many things we could say, because <laughs> after that, they move off to Minnesota, which I'm not sure what 
and God was moving you there, but she became, I don't know why God she, moved us there she either. She became but. <laughs> Mrs. Universe, everybody. She won Mrs. Universe. I mean, it just has been incredible to see every step that God is platform that God has given you. Um, we talk about not being a statistic. Well, you're just like, you're rewriting the rules of what God can do. Um, and then we get to fostered. So what got you to the point where you said, okay, I'm willing to take my heart and my life and my struggles and my difficulties and everything I went through and lay it all out to allow God to use that. I had been sharing on social media, just little snippets of my story throughout college. I had a professor who came to me and I never felt like, I went to Hillsdale College and people are intelligent there and they come from a different background than what I came from. Mm. And so I always felt out of place. I always felt like I wasn't as smart, but I continued to write and share. I didn't feel like my place was the classroom. But I had a professor who came to me and he said, Tori, that was the best piece of writing I've mm. ever written. And I was just like, really? Like, not me? <laughs> Are you sure I wrote that? Um, and I think that, you know, planted a seed of confidence in my writing. And then I just started to share a little bit more. And people kept commenting and they said, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And then people started to send me personal messages, like private mm. messages. And uh, I'll never forget it. I got one that said, Yesterday, I was thinking about ending my life, but I, I found your Instagram post and it inspired me. And I continued to receive these messages of, you know, we heard your story a year ago and we just adopted our daughter today because we started fostering after we heard your story. <laughs> and I, you know, there's so much, so many opinions around social media, but I really believe as Christians, we can be in the world of social media, mm -hmm. but not of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where we can be a light in a dark place. Yeah. It's a place, it really is a second world. And if we're not using it, we're losing an opportunity mm -hmm. to tell people about God. And social media is not for everybody, but I think if you have the talents to use it, then as a Christian, we really should. And so I could see the power of it being it there. But as people were telling me, you know, you should write a book, I was like, no one's going to read a memoir. I mean, I was 23. I'm 27 now. Started writing the book when I was like 22 and then kind of started moving in the realm of publishing when I was 23. And I was like, no one's going to read a memoir from a 23-year-old. <laughs> like, like, I'm 23. <laughs> and people still just kept coming to me. And I was like, I think what God has done in my life needs a permanent place so that people can see what God can do in their life. And so I started... Um, pitching to literary agents, got over 50 denials because no one wants to read a memoir from a 23 year old, mm -hmm. that's just the reality. And then a publisher actually reached out to me through social media, which is a very unusual way to get a book deal. Usually you have to have a literary agent and then your literary mm -hmm. agent publish, like pitches it to publishers. But a publisher came to me and said, we would like you to write a book for us. The next, the next segment of the God story right there. Yes. <laughs> Doing yes. things differently than what the world yes. expects. Yes, yes, yes. And God, um, that was confirmation for me that God wanted the story to like, I got all these no's and I was like, you know, maybe I did hear God wrong. And if so, that's okay. Sometimes we hear God wrong mm -hmm. and we just pivot and we ask God, okay, what do you actually want me to do? And I was probably like in a month period of like, okay, God, you don't want me to write the book. So tell me what you want me to do, because I just want to be obedient to you. And I was in this phase of like, I was pe speaking publicly and I was like, okay, man, I'm just supposed to speak. And then I, the publisher came to me and said, we'd really like you to write a book. Um, and I was like, okay, I prayed through it and I was like, did I hear God wrong or did I just need to be more patient? Mm. And I think that there were pieces of the story, I see now, there are pieces of the story that God wanted to refine. I think he wanted me to have more healing, more grace mm. for my mom. Um, because when we share our stories, right, if we're hurt and we share those stories from a place of hurt, mm. we're going to hurt people. Mm. But if we are healed and we share our stories from a place of healing, then we're going to help heal people. Right, right. Well, one of the things that, that's a central focus in, in your book and in your life is the foster care system and your heart for older kids in that foster care system. And in your day-to-day -day life, you and your husband have exhibited that. You become foster parents. Uh, you now mentioned you've got your younger sister living with you. You're living that out. So it's not just what you personally have experienced, but now you want to turn around and bless others. Not, and even if it's not you, you want to raise awareness so that others can be doing the same thing. I think it just goes back to, you know, that 
that time where I changed my perspective of my life. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it wasn't just about the awards. It wasn't just about the accolades. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about me. It was about thousands of survivors mm -hmm. coming after me who the reality is will not have the mentors that I have, do not have the church community that I have because people aren't showing up or people are scared to engage in the life of kids who come from hard places. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to encourage people, you know, that like my track coach, he didn't have some kind of amazing education. He didn't have some kind of certification. He was a factory worker during the day. People always think he was a teacher. So they're like, oh, he has to have some kind of mm -hmm. specialization with kids. But he was a factory worker during the day. Mm. And then he coached at night. And it just shows like you don't have to be like have, have all these special accolades or certifications to do God's work. You just have to say yes to him because we mm -hmm. serve an extraordinary God. And so our lives are just, we want to be a reflection of Jesus' love and we want to encourage other believers, other people in Christ that they can step up and love those who need loved. Mm -hmm. So we're almost out of time, just a few minutes left, but you talk about doing what God has called and you are now continuing to enrich not just kids in foster care, but women. I see what God is doing as you you, you're in these conferences, you're in, but you guys don't realize, okay, Tori is from the Defiance area. She's a hometown girl in a sense, but this girl has been everywhere. She was you know, on stage with Bob Goff. She was on the 700 Club. Mm -hmm. She was on Good Morning America. I mean, she's like, can you come to Lima? You wanna come to Little Lima? <laughs> but you know, it's, it's about what God is using her for. And she brings women together, young women together. And you just create this environment of, God being there in a sense of encouragement for these women. I, my heart is to give them what I had. So mm -hmm. I had a community, right? I had people that stuck by me when things were really hard and when I was really unlovable. Like when I, I no one should have stuck by me. I mm -hmm. wasn't the easiest kid, especially when I was like in junior high in my early mm -hmm. high school years. And I want these survivors, these women, to have a community that supports them and loves them. And so we put them um, at this retreat together and they've all been through things that are very similar. Oftentimes when you've been through the foster care system, you know, a very small percentage of people have experienced actually been in the foster care system. Mm. So when you're around other people who've experienced the same thing that you have, you feel like you're not so alone. You feel like seen and heard and known for the first time for a lot mm. of these women. And so we bring them together and we show them that mm. they have each other. And it's so wild when they leave, like we don't have anything that says you have to stick together in one way or another. We don't like put together these Zoom meetings, but they do, <laughs> they do. They <laughs> organize it all and they stay close and they're, they just love each other in such radical, beautiful ways. And then when we're at the retreat, we talk a lot about healing and we talk a lot about the p power of storytelling. And we talk a lot about identity and who God says, says they are. And there's just a lot of healing that takes, takes place. And it's mm. just because the Holy Spirit works and moves. And there's so, many, so much stuff that you know, mm. we plan and God shows up in way bigger ways and he changes <laughs> it. And so it really is... Uh, the work of God through through these small retreats that we do. And I say small because, you know, we have like 15 to 20 women that come because we don't, you know, all these women have experienced egregious trauma in one way mm -hmm. or another. And we really want to pour into them mm -hmm. and we really want them to get to know each other. And so we keep the retreat small so it stays intimate and God really is just moving in wild ways that I never even planned. <laughs> so I hear you saying that regardless of someone's past, God can heal, God can use it, God can restore. Yes, I love the scripture, Genesis 50, 20, which says you have, things you have done to me were supposed to harm me, but God has used it for good, the saving of many lives. And I see that in my life and I see it in the lives of those coming after me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, we're going to end it there. Uh, Tori Peterson, the book is called Fostered. You can see the information on the screen of where you can pick up your copy. You can also call me at the station and I'll make sure that we figure out where to get your copy. Tori also has a lot of social media channels. We're going to point you to those as well. Thank you so very much Thank for you being so much. with us. And I'm just, I just love what God's doing and I look forward to seeing what he does next. Thank you. Learn more about Tori on her website, ToriHopePeterson.com. There you will also find a link to purchase her book, Fostered. I highly recommend it. Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for your ongoing partnership. 
The reason we can bring you interviews just like this one is because of your support. Our spring funding campaign is underway now. We invite you to send a special donation this month. Perhaps your Sunday school group or Bible study would like to take up a one-time donation. Every dollar donated stays right here in this region as we continue this ministry to impact others with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Donate online at WTLW.com or call 419-339-4444. And then tune in again next month for our In the Community April special where we will bring you another amazing testimony of God working in the lives of His children. I'm Jennifer Beck. Thanks for watching this edition of In the Community.